Good morning. This is Anna Imagination. I am with the Healing Garden, and this is day five, the last day of the power of self. I just got done doing this massive amount of exploration in Psych Soup. Psych Soup is one of my podcasts, playlists, where I do a lot of my research. It's where I sit down, and when I have a new concept or theory, it's where I use exploratory dialogue to run through my concepts so I can logically find the next path. And recently I've opened this beautiful jar of worms. It's taking identity to the next level. So I'm calling this a bonus section. And the work I did over in Psyched Soup just now was absolutely tied into the power of self. And now that I have this information, I'm looking at it going, okay, this really needs to be included in the identity section of the power of self, but that was on day one. So I really wanna, I'm just gonna throw this in here as a bonus video because it's extraordinary. This is information that really, it's extraordinary. I do parenting classes and I will be presenting my first parenting course in December. So where you are now is basically the power of self. This is class one. Next month I'm going to be doing goddess training. The month after that, I think I focus on manifestation and mindset. I think, I can't remember. And then after that, I'm going to be doing love, romance, relationships, where I have a five-day course where I take all of the information here and I expand on it into each one of these. And then in December, I go into parenting. There is... And when I get into parenting, it basically explains that, okay, you have building of the identity and then you have, it's extraordinary. Like the more I think about this, the more it's just falling into place and click, 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 click. And it's just mind blowing. And I'm still reeling from the mind blowing, but it's so vital that I'm just like, oh my God, I want to jump right out here and get it. So I'm going to borrow from my parenting class and I'm just going to start piecing this together and show you how this goes. Ideally, when we are born, we are born without, with two things. We have an, our, our identity and our authority. A healthy, conscious, aware parent who has done triadic healing, who is aware of conscious awareness, has the skills to then not only cultivate their own identity, but to cultivate the identity and the authority of their children, which is ultimately my goal, is to get this into the hands of parents and teachers so that when they are working with students, when they are working with children, they have the ability to cultivate the power of self with their own offspring. Really, really important. And I've done this with my own daughter. I'm doing this now very much where I watch her as a 15 year old taking in the triadic healing. And whenever I interact with my daughter, I have two things in mind. I must preserve her identity and I must preserve her authority. Whenever she calls me up or tells me what she's going to do, I, before I interact with my daughter, almost every time I remind myself, and this is becoming part of my programming because I say it so, because I want this to be part of my subconscious programming. And that's really what I'm showing you here. This is really what we're doing is you have a subconscious mind with your program and it's running off of your instinct and your animal stage. Everyone's does. Conscious awareness is deciding to change your own program and to implement your own program of your own design into your subconscious mind so that your subconscious mind runs off of your own computer programming. Now, the old programming is left over from our Neanderthal days and the Ice Age, which is keep the unit safe and love is dangerous. The new program needs to prioritize knowledge and this information above safety. So I have 
premises, new beliefs that I wrote myself and that I put into my brain, into my subconscious mind on purpose using conditioning and brainwashing on myself so that my subconscious mind will run on the program I want it to run on. And this requires, because it's the subconscious mind and it's a machine, a very precise science of logic to know exactly what needs to be said and what needs to be plugged in. It is an understanding that there is a frequency that we all live off of. And when we are true to that frequency inside of us and within the energy pool, everything runs beautifully as it was naturally meant to run. So my programming is preserve the energy. That means making sure that my words aren't toxic, making sure that my outlook is positive, making sure that I'm focused constantly on conscious awareness and nurturing of the identity. And then it's valuing the safety and identity of those I love. So it's vital that my children have the freedom to exercise their own conscious awareness, that my children have the freedom and the psychological safety to define who they are. And that's what I wanna talk about now is the definition of who you are. And this is gonna be really important when we introduce emotions later today. When we are born, we enter into the world in stages. There's animal mode. Animal mode is literally 100% of your subconscious mind. You have no conscious awareness. This is victim mode. You are helpless and you are completely dependent, 100% dependent upon the survival of somebody else, usually a caregiver. By the time we hit five to eight years old, we have a defined self. If you have a healthy relationship, if you have a healthy life, you have defined the self. If you have defined the self, you are now only using 5% of conscious awareness. I call this Neanderthal stage because it is literally equivalent to a Neanderthal. We are still, as a society, in that mindset where people are only using 5% of their conscious awareness. They are relying on their subconscious to do 95% of the work, and they are not consciously aware. As a result, you have a lot of people wearing business suits. You have a lot of people driving cars. You have a lot of people having children and they have zero conscious awareness and they're living their life like a Neanderthal. They literally have no conscious awareness. What separates human being from animal is conscious awareness. And the only way to get conscious awareness is education and information. So what ends up happening is there becomes a pursuit of knowledge for the sole purpose of expanding conscious awareness and getting us further away from animal. And it's a spectrum. And I'm just going to come right out and say it. There's animal and there's godlike. And humans, human beings, are in the middle. Now, our ego says we're here. Science says we're here because we're only 5% different. So we're here. You don't get to be here until you're using conscious awareness and you're using 95% of your conscious awareness. You don't get to be here. Just because you're a human being doesn't mean a damn thing. I have known many people who are dumber than dogs dumber than whales, dumber than wolves, because they're here. And it is man's ego that makes us think that we're over here. No, we're not. There's actually a divide happening in the human race right now where there's some of us using a lot more of our conscious awareness. 
but the average is over here. Ironically, the stupider a human being is, the more their ego is at work. It isn't until you check that ego in place, because ego comes from the subconscious mind, completely comes from the subconscious mind. Humility comes from conscious awareness. So you have to learn how to turn off your ego. Your ego is pure fear. Your ego is nothing but fear. So, which is an animal, by the way, which is an animal, which is very much an animal. So you're running off of this fear and this animal. And manifestation, by the way, is like way up here, which is another thing is a lot of people over here are trying to do this. And if they had conscious awareness, if they had intelligence, they would realize, oh, I can't do this yet. But they don't. They have ego. So they're here. And everyone's tiptoeing around this. I don't. I very bluntly say, you understand that the difference between you and your cat is 5%. That's it. Your cat is almost smarter than you. Because you have not studied. You have not learned how to think. Philosophy is the only subject known to mankind that teaches us how to think. Once you learn how to think, it changes the game. And it's the dumbest thing we could have ever have done to our society is remove philosophy, which is why so many people are so uneducated is because they can read a book but there is a difference between reading a book and understanding a book. There is a difference between having a conversation and understanding it. So there's going to get to a point where I just start to say to people, I cannot communicate with you until you study philosophy. Because there's a, a dialogue that must take place. And if you do not you can't shortcut this. You can't go instant gratification on this. This information over here, this status of existence is a reward for hard work. Not physical hard work, that's slavery. Mental hard work. You have to want to be smarter. You have to want to pursue, and you must pursue, higher education. In order to do that, you need philosophy, which teaches you how to think. I really just need to do philosophy classes. I really need to just do philosophy classes, which I think I would enjoy doing. I'm going to do philosophy classes. Do you see what I just did there? I want to break that down because that is it exactly. I thought about what I need. I really need to teach people philosophy. And then I imagined, I love imagination. I imagined me teaching philosophy and I felt joy flood my heart. Like I just felt joy in my heart chakra. And I went, oh, and identity went, oh, I want to do that. And I went, okay, apparently. And then immediately she took that imagination. She took that feeling of joy and she, boom, go, dream. Oh, okay. All right. We're doing it. So I will be teaching a philosophy course. Now, everything I just did over the last five minutes is conscious awareness. Let's call this our first philosophy class. That is conscious awareness. Oh, I feel it. I feel it. I say I will. I declare that I am. See how that works? This is philosophy. I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am. I remember when I first read those words, I was 15. And it was, I think, therefore I am. I think that was Kant. K-A-N-T. He was a philosopher. The opposite side of that is, I am, therefore I think. Oh my God, do I see it now. Wow. I cannot remember which philosopher that was who said that. It may have been Socrates. I can't remember. It doesn't really matter. But what does is I'll show you this. An animal does neither one of these. An animal is instinct. The Neanderthal says, I am. Therefore, I think. 
But the student, the philosopher says, I think, therefore I am. And the teacher knows the difference and tells it to the other people. <laughs> that's the difference. So you are either, and that's it, by the way, you are either animal, Neanderthal, student, or teacher. So here's how the spectrum works. An animal has zero conscious awareness. It is my cat. It is my cat breaking the screen, lounging in the window, and being too stupid to realize that when it rolls, it's going to fall out the window. And she does. And we have to constantly jump up and pull him back or babysit the cat, which is why I'm always in the kitchen with the window open is because I'm babysitting a cat. And the next stage up is Neanderthal. There are the people who teach there are the, and I, I use this as an example in Psych Soup just now. You take 100 people, you put them on an island, you give them books. And then you step back and you watch how they evolve. Assume they do not breed and multiply. Assume it's just the 100 people. It's going to start with all of them, 100% ignoring the books. Eventually, one of them is going to get curious, learn the books and study the language and translate them, one person then that person is going to tell the other Neanderthals. And it might get one or two stragglers who come over and say, yes, this is awesome. And then they begin a book club. Because if I were a Neanderthal and I had books and I learned how to use them, the first thing I would do is make a book club. It's, it's a book thing. <laughs> you you got to have a book club. I love books. And there's more people who love books. You do a book club. So you now have a book club, okay? And you have all of these people over here who love the books. And then you have people who are curious about the books but don't say anything. And then you have everybody else who just doesn't give a shit. Okay. The people who don't give a shit are the Neanderthals. The students are the ones who step forward and say, give me the books I want to learn. Now, eventually this group grows and grows. And one person, usually the first one becomes the teacher. That's where teaching comes from. So now you have one person emerging out of this student status and becomes the teacher. Maybe you get two teachers and then you have pod students and then they converse and these people converse. And when these people converse, more Neanderthals come over and trickle in and trickle in. So you have three statuses, okay? You have the teachers who understand all, who get a wide, big picture, who comprehend, who can see the big picture. And then you have the students. And the students are the ones who are open-minded, defining their identity and their learning. And then you have the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals don't give a shit. The Neanderthal is where the majority of us are. The majority of us are. The majority of us are Neanderthals. These are the people who have mental illness, who say, I'm not going to do anything about it. These are the people who say, yeah, I have mental illness and I don't care. They are the people who say, yeah, I have mental illness. I'm, I just, I'm just throwing everything into the whim. That is 5% upgrade from an animal. And in some cases you are stupider than the animal. This is the status where we all start off as. It is the, I am, so I think, but there's nothing I can do about it. It is very much a victim mindset. It is, I have no authority. I have no control. I am nobody. Everything happens to me. Poor me. Why does this keep happening to me? Neanderthal. The next step up from that is the student. This is where the student starts to separate via intelligence itself with growth away from the Neanderthal. There's a gap, an education gap that starts to happen that separates the student from the Neanderthal. And when the student first comes in, they're a Neanderthal and they grow and they grow and that distance gets further and further away and their conscious awareness expands so that eventually they will look at the Neanderthal and go, wow, are you stupid? Because the Neanderthal is choosing to remain like an animal. It thinks that 5% difference between an animal and itself is good enough. If you're wondering where I'm pulling these numbers from, the 5%, 95%, 100%, NIM, National Institute of Mental Health, and the CDC, 
did a study that proves the majority of people only use 5% of their conscious awareness. Fact, animals have no conscious awareness. Most of them, cats, dogs, chickens, they, they use 100% of their subconscious minds, okay? Neanderthals, average human being, uses only 95% of their subconscious mind to make most of their decisions. Now, you can change the statistic by deciding that you have authority. When you have authority, you decide, you can decide to increase your conscious awareness, which is usually what happens with conscious awareness is, oh, I don't have to be abused. Oh, that's a choice. I don't have to be poor. Oh, if I increase my conscious awareness, I can be wealthy. Oh, poverty is a mental illness. Well, why the fuck would I choose that? I wouldn't. I want to be wealthy. So I'm going to increase my conscious awareness to get a better life. But the Neanderthal who only uses 5% of conscious awareness instead says, why does this always happen to me? And then promptly does nothing about it. So now there's a divide happening. You have a Neanderthal and you have an animal and the only difference between them is 5%. That's not good enough for me. That's not good enough for some people. So that's when those who are in Neanderthal stage realize that they don't have to be a Neanderthal. They can do something about it, which when you step into the wonderful world of philosophy is existentialism. Existentialism is easily my favorite branch of philosophy. Existentialism is the pursuit of the question, are we in control? Who are we? Why are we here? How did we get here? Where are we going? Who is God? What is God? And, oh, to Douglas Adams, who is this God person anyway? That is breaking away from the wonderful world and stepping into existentialism. It is the pursuit of knowledge to figure out why we are here. And it is the difference between the student and the Neanderthal. The Neanderthal will not ask these questions. They will assume it has the answer. It will declare that it is helpless, it is a victim, and it has nothing whatsoever in its own control. Ironically, that is the same message that our abusers teach us. Our abusers teach us to be a Neanderthal so they can abuse us. Here's the fun thing. When you become a student, when you step into philosophy, when you become a teacher, you tell the abusers who are Neanderthals to fuck off. And suddenly you don't deal with abuse anymore because you're busy asking the big question. Because you have decided to pursue your identity. When you decide to pursue your identity, you are actually stepping into philosophy. You are asking the big question. The Neanderthal has been told this is who you are, this is the pecking order, this is God, and this is where you are on the status pole. That's Neanderthal. The philosopher, the student, steps back and says, why? Why does it have to be that way? Who are we really? Where are we going? And what are we doing? You know what? I'm going to go find my own answers. You can keep your 5% of your conscious mind. That's not good enough for me. So then you step into the next stage of thought. Welcome to being a student. Welcome to triadic healing. You have officially begun the pursuit of the self. I don't know why it took me five days to realize this. I don't know why it took me a year to conclude this. That all we are doing when we pursue the identity is we are defining ourselves and there is nothing more solid than existentialism to pursue this task. Now, this is the beautiful thing of that gorgeous, gorgeous mother nature. This is where the nature has shit figured out. And this is how much we as humans interfere. When a child is born, the system is already set up. The system, the nature is already set up for the child 
to pursue this line of thought and reasoning. But the child is born to the Neanderthal who decides to stop the process. This is how it works. If the child is born to a student or a teacher, the student and the teacher have learned enough philosophy to let the child alone, nature will take care of it. They get to watch their children develop along healthy and properly. The child, by the time it reaches five and eight years old, has completely explored its identity. The teacher, the philosopher, I'm just gonna call it the philosopher, the philosopher knows to leave the child alone, nature will take over, and the child will figure itself out within five to eight years. Sure enough, the five to eight-year-old will be like, I know who I am. I want to be when I grow up, whatever they want to be when they grow up. And then they will fight tooth and nail to preserve and love that. They are given the imagination to dream. They are given all of the tools in their identity to explore and to ask all the right questions. They instinctively ask, why are we here? Where did we come from? Mommy, where do babies come from? These are natural questions that children are ingrained to ask because the nature takes care of its shit. But the Neanderthal feels that it has to tamper with this process because the Neanderthal thinks it knows better. So the Neanderthal decides to take the child and punish the child for being curious, asking questions. And the Neanderthal feels, because it's lack of ego, that the only way to gain an identity of its own self is to control and manipulate and harm others, which is what a lot of what the Neanderthal does. So it ends up harming the child, redirecting the child, suppressing the child, and it takes the child's authority away. Now the philosopher's child has been preserved so that by the time the child is eight, the child can then go on the next stage, which is solidifying the identity and forcing the identity. I know who I am, says the eight-year-old. Now let's explore the world and figure out how to enhance what I am. This is where my programming got fucked up. This is where my Neanderthals started to tamper with me. Because I said at eight years old, this is who I am. And my Neanderthals said, no, you're not. We're changing this. And they did. And they fucked me up. That's abuse. So the philosopher's child would then be given a psychologically safe place to continue to nurture the enforcement and the strengthening of their identity. They would then go on to explore new things more things. They would add to the identity, enhancing it, building a strong foundation for when they are ready to start receiving authority. In addition, at eight years old to 15, they would develop the freedom and the ability to start exercising their own authority with the phrase, I am going to. I am going to go to the store. I am not going to wear my jacket. I know it's two degrees outside and I'm not wearing my jacket. I don't want to wear my shoes. I want pizza for breakfast. I want donuts all the time. I don't want to eat my green vegetables. Now, an adult, let's change it around. A Neanderthal will look at this and judge the child and think, well, that's stupid. And then they will tell the child all of this stuff, destroying the identity and the ego and squash the child. The philosopher will look at the child and know exactly what the child is doing and the importance of what it is doing. They will value the importance of what it is doing and they will value the child's desires and needs to do it. And they won't fuck around with nature because they know that nature knows better. So instead, they will provide the Socratic method. Really? You're not going to wear a jacket? You know, it's two degrees outside, right? And the child will go, I don't care, I. And they're, they're like, okay, they're blowing up the word I and they're the ego and okay, they're gonna explore the ego. So the philosopher in its internal wisdom will grab the child's jacket in secret and allow the child to go outside when it's two degrees. They will get into the car, the child will be walking and the child will go, Hmm. And the child will automatically start to process its own reasoning without the influence of the philosopher. 
It will think things like, wow, it's really cold. I regret. I wish I had my jacket. Now the philosopher is on standby. What do you think of your decision today? What do you think of your choice? You look cold. Interesting. And the child will go, yeah, it's cold. Yeah, yeah, it's cold. And the child has just the right of humility. And the child all on its own will say, I should have worn my jacket. Hmm. What do you think you'll do next time? I think I'll wear my jacket. I did bring your jacket just in case you changed your mind. Would you like your jacket? Yes, please. And you give the child the jacket. Now, the child still has the jacket. The child is still fine. But the child had the freedom to explore its own mistake without damaging from the outside influencer. That is good parenting. The Neanderthal would probably punch the child, spank the child, force the child to wear the jacket and put the child outside anyway. The child would scream and cry. And instead of focusing on learning its identity, it's focused now on surviving your tantrum as a Neanderthal child. Completely different program. Now it stops being about what the child wants and it starts being about how the child is going to survive its own existence. That's trauma. Now let's flip back on over to the philosopher's child. So the philosopher's child goes on to these trial and errors. It gets wiser, it gets smarter, and it does so left to nature's device while it learns and practices its own authority with the words, I will, I am, I will. The words, I will, are directly linked to authority. Now the Neanderthal child loses the words, I will, and has no authority. So they never get to practice using and exercising authority. Meanwhile, the philosopher's child completely embellishes and grows with the words, I will. So that when your child is 15, the child can say to the philosopher, I will stay after school tonight. And the child who has fully developed its identity, has defined itself, now is sitting in a place where it can practice the use of its own authority with the words, I will. The philosopher understands the importance of the phrase, I will. And because the philosopher has done the work on their own identity, they can step back from this, look at their child and say, okay, please be considerate enough to tell me when you leave so I know if anything happens, I can report it to the authorities accordingly. And because there is a mutual respect happening with an understanding that the nature is going to take care of the situation, the child is able at 15 years old to pretty much run its own life. And it doesn't need anything in its life to enhance it. It doesn't need crutches. Meanwhile, the Neanderthal's child is incapable of exercising authority, has never even seen authority, has learned that if you, it uses the phrase, I will, it will probably get beaten and it's completely tampered down and it's still trying to figure itself out because its identity was taken away from it because the Neanderthal uses its child as a crutch. A crutch is a tool, a person in most cases, but also an object or a tool to prop up the identity because it lacks a definition of self. When you lack a definition of self, you require crutches to keep your house standing on the sand. This is where you have children to help as a crutch to define you. This is where you seek out celebrity watching because you live vicariously through them. This is where you seek alcohol because the alcohol helps you ignore the fact that you don't know who you are. This is where most of us seek out a relationship. Nothing is a bigger, better crutch than finding another partner to lean on. This is why I do not offer any romance, love, or relationship classes. Because it's a crutch. And it's bullshit. If you do the work, you end up not needing or wanting a relationship when it's all over anyway. Because most relationships are a crutch. And it's a diversion. And it's bullshit. And our society is completely designed 
to nurture that crutch. Love, romance, and relationships are the biggest addiction in this society. It is literally equivalent to alcoholism. We're going to leave that alone because that's a whole nother nightmare. But you have crutches. The Neanderthal loves its crutches. The Neanderthal uses its offspring, its friendships, its children, its job, its delusions, its addictions to constantly build its own delusion because it lacks identity. Meanwhile, the philosopher has a solid grounding knowledge of the identity. It knows who it is. It doesn't need any crunches. It stands on its own feet because it has a solid foundation of defined self. So that when it decides to have a relationship, the relationship becomes an extension of itself, a celebration of who they are and not a crutch. It's not possible to have a relationship that is healthy if you have an undefined self. Not possible. The philosopher has the defined self so that when it chooses a partner, it is choosing somebody who literally glorifies and celebrates their self. And then when they have offspring and children, their children are not crutches. Their children are free to be its own, whatever the child needs to be. And it's a completely separate entity from the adult, from the philosopher. But the Neanderthal does not live like this, does not think like this. The Neanderthal has no defined self because the Neanderthal was raised as a crutch for its parents. Just as the Neanderthal's child is being raised as a crutch for its parents. And so on and so on. Now, on occasion, one of these children of the Neanderthals, me, and anyone else who usually steps out of it, very few of us are philosopher children. Most of us are Neanderthal children who finally realize that our parents are fucked up and we're done with it and we want to change. That is when the Neanderthal child becomes a black sheep. That is when the Neanderthal child starts to become more consciously aware than the Neanderthal. And there starts to be a bridge that gaps. That is when the Neanderthal starts to really abuse the black sheep because it's not allowing it to be a crutch. And that is when the black sheep, the Neanderthal child finally breaks away, distance itself and steps into the world of philosophy. Now, before it can do anything, it has to go back to the beginning and define the self. That is what you are doing. You're not healing. You're leveling up. That is what you are doing. You did not have a philosopher as a child. You are raised by a Neanderthal. You are changing class systems. You are leveling up. There's a whole nother world over here that you had no idea existed. That's why you're here because you were a black sheep who was different and you refused to be a crutch anymore. Now, there's a whole lot of really awesome shit over here. The philosopher's child gets to go on to the next stage where after defining the self and strengthening the self, they get to go on to the next stage of knowing and belonging and authority. They now have the grounding set work so that when they listen to somebody talk to them, they can observe with respect. And that's it. Talk to me. I'll listen. I'm observing with respect. Observing with respect is only achieved. I am not there yet. I'm going to tell you right now, I am not there yet. I know that's my next stage. I am not there yet. I just got to the knowing, the belonging, and the authority. Now I'm learning how to observe with respect. I don't know how yet. I'm working on it, but I'm going to reach there very, very soon. And I do mean in the next week or two, I'm going to be there. 
That's when I can start turning my comments back on and I can start listening to people without being carried away because I was a Neanderthal child who got out of it, who stepped into the next level. I had to learn all of this shit. Now I'm teaching it to people so they too can step away from their Neanderthals so they can step into the next level up. When they do this, they're going to reach the knowing, the belonging, and the authority. And when they do that, then they're going to master observing with respect. When you reach observing with respect, you encompass the entire teacher role. Now you get to thrive. This is when the world of manifestation opens up to you. And then you have access to the truth. You don't get the truth until you pass the exams. You don't get the truth until you reach the knowing, the belonging, and the authority. You don't get the knowing, the belonging, and the authority until you do the work. So if you're dabbling in manifestation already, you're acting like a monkey with instant gratification. You're still a Neanderthal. Go back to square one. Welcome to the world of philosophy. Now, the philosopher's child has been free to explore their natural ways at the mercy of the nature. And the nature knows what to do. It's all in our programming. It is the Neanderthal who fucks it all up. The philosopher knows this. The philosopher has gone through the same process. So the philosopher has said, I'm going to be wise enough to trust the nature with my children. And I do. And I'm watching the nature take care of my daughter and it's amazing. I've been sitting back, observing her, watching her. And she's 15 and she's starting to reach the knowing, the belonging and the authority. And I'm going, son of a bitch. I should have been raised like that. We all should have been raised like this. I don't envy her. I am grateful and joyous for her. My son, it's too late. My son is already abused by the Neanderthal. I did not get him out in time. So he has to now go through the path that I went through. My oldest daughter, she's in full Neanderthal mode. I can't touch her. She's going to have to go through the process. Her offspring, her children are going to be her crutches until she crosses over. This is the difference. My son is starting to cross over because I manifest that shit because I have reached the knowing, the belonging, and the authority, and I have reached the truth. So I'm already dabbling in manifestation going, take care of my son. Give him positivity. Heal my son. My son will become more positive. My son will learn to be more compassionate and gentle with himself because I know that that's where it starts. That's where the healing starts. When you cross over from Neanderthal, the very first thing you do is you realize this is about self-identity. This is conscious awareness. This is all about you and your relationship with you. Every time I say this, every time I talk about it in any of my classes, one thing keeps popping up in my mind, English class. I remember sitting there in English class. English was my favorite subject in school, music and English. And in English class, we went over the story. It's either man versus nature, man versus God, or man versus himself. No way, it's man versus man, man versus nature, or man versus himself. Those are the three types of conflict in all literature. And then we're given a whole lot of books for the entire year, and we're told to analyze this. In the books, Lord of the Flies, what is it? It is man versus nature. In the book, mm, The Most Dangerous Game, short story, what is it? The conflict is man versus man. In the role of life, in the role you are right now, it is man versus himself. But we all play the game differently. The philosopher knows that it's man versus himself. The Neanderthal thinks it's man versus man. (laughs) 
That's right. The, ma- the Neanderthal thinks that it's man versus man. Really, at that stage, it's man versus nature because nature takes care of itself, but man keeps resisting it. Man keeps pushing it. When you step over into conscious awareness, you realize that the battle was never man versus nature. Well, you never you realize that it was never man versus man. What was really happening in Neanderthal mode was it was man versus nature. Stepping into conscious awareness is when you go, oh, I was in my own way. This is man versus himself. I look at my beautiful son and I think, Daniel, your only enemy right now is yourself. I know this, but I cannot tell this to him because he is currently in Neanderthal mode. I did not get him out soon enough. It was when I watched my daughter turn 17 years old and I realized what I had done to her. I realized that I had failed. I realized that as intelligent as she is, she was still a Neanderthal because she was still fighting the delusion of man versus man. So she turned on me. She turned on her brother, who was her best friend. And then she started to spew about how everyone's out to get her, and it's man versus man. And she says this while fighting the natural flow of life. So I'm watching her battle nature while she screams that it's man versus man. And really, if she stopped fighting nature, She would find herself. Man is nature. But you don't know that until you step over here and you enter the knowing. But you don't get to enter the knowing until you do the work. We're going to take a minute to meditate. Every time I give one of these lectures, there's moments where I think and I feel, let us pray. No, dead serious, dead serious. Every time I, I get off of this, I have a moment of, let's pray. And every time it happens, I think, why? What, what, what the fuck is it? Is it that my Christian upbringing? And at first, <laughs> I'm like, is that my Neanderthal crap? So today, I finally decided, and it's been two weeks, every time I go on one of my classes, and then there's a moment where I go, let us pray. And I'm like, what are you doing? And I realized that that is my intuition saying, now you need to meditate. Oh, I need to meditate. You know, I'm going to follow that. See this? This is me consciously aware that it's man versus nature, but I'm not going to versus anybody. This is the difference between Neanderthal and philosopher. In the philosopher mind, you realize that there is no verses. That is the allowing. Let us pray. (laughs) Seriously, let's meditate. We're going to meditate. And I don't know why, but we need to meditate right now. So meditate in, deep breath. And exhale. I know why we're supposed to meditate. Inhale. Religious leaders do it and they don't know why because they don't understand the theory because they didn't study philosophy. But they're following their intuition because religious leaders understand the intuition. They don't know that it's intuition. They think it's God. So religious leaders do a lot of things right, but they lack the theory. That's the difference between a philosopher and a man of faith. A man of faith is just monkeying what feels good without understanding why. A philosopher knows why. When you enter the knowing, the belonging, and the authority, you see the truth. The truth contradicts the man of faith. You know this when you enter the knowing, the belonging, and the the, the authority. You are supposed to meditate because it helps with the processing, because it solidifies the new knowledge, and you level up. And then you get more knowledge and then you level up. 
And then you get more knowledge and you level up. But you can't do that without the meditation. The Buddha knew this, which is why the Buddha literally meditated 24-7 for 50 years. Because he was going through the philosophy and meditating, philosophy, meditating, philosophy, meditating. That is how you level up. That is learning. We learn this in philosophy. Which is why so many people, Neanderthals, are drawn to faith. The Neanderthals are in two categories. They are those with faith and those without. Neanderthal. Those with faith and those without. Those with faith are feeling the nature. They're halfway there, but they don't understand the why because they're not consciously aware. The scientist is consciously aware. The scientist is kind of an anomaly. The scientist, the scientist, oh, oh now I understand you, H.G. Wells. I've been trying to figure you out for so long. See, that's why we meditate. H.G. Wells never named his characters. And in the time traveler, in the time machine, his book, in, in H.G. Wells' time machine, the book opens up with this massive conversation between five to 10 men. And the men were the time traveler, the philosopher, the theologian, the artist, the scientist, the archaeologist. And I went, wait, where, where, where's their names? Their names are not important. Oh, H.G. Wells was a philosopher. H.G. Wells was a philosopher. So you have the Neanderthal with faith, who's kind of dabbled in the nature, and you have the Neanderthal without the faith, who's just there. And then you have the philosopher, the student. The scientist has no faith in most cases but they're trying to figure out the theory through metrics. But that doesn't mean that they've studied philosophy. This is why philosophy matters because philosophy teaches you to think. The scientist goes the long way around. They can be right, but now they run the risk of ego. They run the risk of imbalance and trauma. And because they haven't gone the way of the philosopher, they will never, they will struggle. The scientist is the harder road to the same answers. The philosopher is the easier road with the same answers at the end. The philosopher allows and welcomes the nature and embraces it. So this is the road you are on. This is where you have decided to go. You have decided to step out of Neanderthal and become a student. There is a road, there is a process. Everything that the philosopher's child did, does, was raised on, is what you now have to go through. But you're starting at 40, you're starting at 50, you're starting at 60. Stop touching manifestation. You have no business being there yet. People, Neanderthals, will dabble in manifestation to get richer, to get what they want. The philosopher who has done the work will use manifestation to help others, to educate, to benefit mankind. That is when the nature steps in and says, you understand, this is part of the truth. This is part of the authority, the knowing, and the belonging. This is level 50. This is why I lead by example. This is why I have my comments turned off for the next two weeks. Because I am ready to step from my knowing and the belonging and the authority into the next stage, which is observe with respect. This is where I become gentler, kinder, calmer, focused. This is where I start to lead just by showing. And I start to save my words for my classes because my words are about to become very, very accurate. That's not ego. That's how a Neanderthal would look at that. That is the knowing. 
The Neanderthal pursues the knowing, so it mimics it because it's stupid. The Neanderthal likes to attack, criticize. The Neanderthal is stupid. The Neanderthal is loud. The Neanderthal has nothing but ego and it has a life built of crutches, which is why when you heal, why when you become awakened, why when you level up, you lose everything because everything was a crutch. That is the truth. That is the way of it. This is the way. <laughs> when I started to pursue my healing, I just wanted the pain to stop. I just wanted my dreams. I just wanted freedom. I stepped into my philosophical realm as a student. For 30 years, I was here. For 30 years. I was surrounded by Neanderthals. Wow, that's perspective. For 30 years, I was a student living among Neanderthals. In 2020, I finally left the Neanderthals and stepped into an actual philosophical environment, New York City where I could take my learning to the next level. A year ago, my learning reached another level. I realized that I was in pursuit of the self and in order to do that, I had to cut everything out. I realized about six months ago that everything in my life was a crutch, that it always had been, which is why I evolved from Angela 1.1 1.0, that's Neanderthal, to Anna 5.0. Anna 5.0 arrived in February and April of this year, April of this year. And I looked back and went, wow, even all of the possessions and people from Anna 0.4 are obsolete because those were crutches for Anna 0.4. So now I am on a 0.5 or on a 5.0. Now I am in the process of cultivating possessions and people when I'm ready that enhance my identity. And they will not come to me as crutches because I don't need crutches. Because I have finally shed the last of Neanderthal. And now I am in the knowing, the belonging, and the authority. I will soon be in the position of observing with respect. And I have truth. I have the truth. This is the way. This is the path ahead. This is triadic healing. This is what we are doing here. So now you have a choice. I've decided to take this video and present it to everybody. I'm going to include it in triadic healing, but it's also going to be available free for everyone. It's probably going to be on like the home page of my website. So you can all come in, step in and look at it and go, oh, that's triadic healing. The nature had a plan for you when you were born to go through a process. But you most likely were born to Neanderthals. In fact, you were born to Neanderthals because if you weren't, you would not need triadic healing. You would not need to resolve your healing. You would not need any of this. It would have been done naturally without any abuse, without any trauma. Nature would have taken care of you. 100% of the people who are here are here because you were raised by Neanderthals, as was I. And there is no instant gratification here. Throw that out. Leave that at the door. There is no ego here. 
You can choose at this point to become a student or you can choose to stay with the Neanderthals. The choice is yours. But do not mistake for one moment that this is going to be easy. It is a process. I communicate the process. I've learned what the process is. I have simplified it. You are stepping into philosophy, a subject that does not exist in this world anymore. In fact, my dream as a child was to be a philosopher. And my first thought was, well, how the fuck am I going to pull that off in the 21st century? A year ago, I realized that I want to be a philosopher when I grow up. And I thought, well, how the fuck am I going to pull that off in the year 2022? Two months ago, I realized I'm a philosopher. I want to be a philosopher. I have to be a philosopher. And I thought, how the fuck am I going to pull that off in 2023? By thinking outside the box. I'm a philosopher. I logicized that shit. It is the pursuit of who we are. A year ago, last summer, I was at a cabin with two girlfriends. It was a wonderful holiday where I really started to find myself. It was the first day the first weekend where I really started to get to know who I was. And there was this moment where I said, I want to be a bard. <laughs> I wanted to be a philosopher and a storyteller who just oral traditions my way through life. And I did not stop to think how. I didn't care. I was doing I did. I am. I think it. Therefore, I am it. That is the power of manifestation. But you have to know who you are, what you are, to pull that off. So if you don't know who you are, if you're still the son of a Neanderthal, the daughter of a Neanderthal, you don't get that power. That power only comes to those with the knowing, the belonging, and the authority. It is the gift, not the prize. That's Neanderthal thinking. It is the gift we are given in the knowing, the belonging, and the authority. There is a moment where you will choose to stop being a Neanderthal and to start pursuing the self. When you are ready, I have my beacon. Come to me. I'll be waiting. Thank you for joining me. And may the kindest of words always find you.